he needs he needs to make his case to Congress and as a result to the American public. Because otherwise it's just, it's it's a very, very hard way to go. The problem is when I talk about his his indecision, I'm talking about things like the fact that he uh, two years ago said we had to have a regime change. One year ago he drew the red line, you know, two weeks ago he said, you know, we need to we need to do something. They crossed the red line. I can do it. All the all of the uh, evidence is there. I can do it without Congress. I'm going to do it without Congress. And then he asked for Congress's <laughs> approval. Those are the things that have led to just people wringing their hands, going, like, including our allies, I might add, going, oh my goodness, you know, who's in charge here? And, and of course, the result is Vladimir Putin has thumbed his nose at him one more time. You know, Bashar Assad is thumbing his nose at him and consequently at the country. Those are uncomfortable places to be when you're the leader of the free world. Um, and that said, and I want this very clear, I support him asking for Congress's approval. I just think there may be times when that's okay, not to, I don't think this is one of them. I do wish you would have called us back right away. I wish you would have called us back right away. I wish you would have presented the evidence right away. I think given your end, remember we're talking about if in fact the evidence supports it and it's true. And you could argue whether we should do it or not, whether it's true or not. But if, if the evidence is true, we are talking about somebody willing to gas his own women, children, and, and other citizens. Yeah. What would prevent him from putting those same citizens in front of the strategic targets that we would hit? And so, as time goes on, I think that becomes a strategic disadvantage. Yes, ma'am. Why should we support a president that wouldn't support our ambassador? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess. We're not, I wouldn't see it as supporting our president so much as I would see supporting something bigger than our president. If it was simply a favor to him, I guess I'd be reluctant to do we it. We have well. children in the military. Sure. Represent. I don't want to send them over there. Mm -hmm. He never supported Secretary, our ambassador, yeah. or those Navy SEALs that yeah. gave up their lives. Okay. I don't think he'll support our daughters over there. And, and he, this is a very important point that they're raising. That's another part of the reluctance. It, I've read the resolution. It's very vague and it's very broad. Could it be that he sent support over there then? That they wouldn't be quite as messy over there now? I think all of that's possible and all of that's debatable. I would say this. Part of his problem and why he's having a hard time convincing Congress and the American people to support his war resolution or his, his resolution for military action is this back to this lack of of um, conviction, if you will, about it, which is carried out in the fact that they don't know how it's going to end. It's a very broad resolution. I've got a copy of it somewhere. It's, it gives the president broad discretion. It says the only use of boots on the ground would be to recover or rescue an airman that went down. Yeah. Um, but we know how those things start. And so the problem becomes are we in it to win it? Are we in it to just send a signal? Let's remember, while he wanted a, a regime change two years ago, last week he said, my goal would not be a regime change, it would be to send a message and, 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 and to make sure that these weapons are never used again. Today he's talking about a regime change again. It's back, it's this sort of back and forth that makes us all a little bit uncomfortable. And that's why if I had to vote today, I'd be on. I will say that, and I've said this to lots of reporters already, so um, if I had to vote today, I couldn't vote for the resolution. Okay, the question is why was he not impeached? Impeachment, of course, requires a, uh, a conviction. And a conviction requires uh, you know, breaking of laws uh, or violation of the Constitution. And while we, you know, we may not like him or somebody may not like a particular policy or a number of policies, impeachment, impeachment can be a great distraction for the or to, um, even to even to stand up to something you disagree with. I think we have plenty of reasons to oppose certain things. I, I, impeachment would be something very drastic that would have to require a lot more uh, I think evidence that something's been wrong. Yes, ma'am. I heard something today that sort of surprised me. I don't know the religious affiliation. Okay, I'm going to let you, because you have something to say. I want to make sure everyone hears it. I heard something today that surprised me, and I didn't know that Ashad has a secularist government 
and the people who are fighting him are, are extremists of some kind or other. If a shot is brought down, what does that leave the Islamists okay. with? Great, okay. She has raised some very important points. Now you guys, you can get above my um, level of knowledge pretty fast, but I will tell you this about <laughs> Assad and, and I've just been going there, to class. Therein lies the problem in the Middle East, but therein lies the problem in the Middle East for decades. Remember, at one point, we were supportive of the, the, um, the uh, 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 Saddam Hussein. Remember in the war against uh, Russia, or the Soviet Union, we supported, we supported the Mujahideen, right? Who became what we're fighting today. And I, I think it was Ronald Reagan once said something about crossing the bridge with somebody that, you know, may not be your friend, but they're not as much your enemy as, you know, the other guy. And that, and when I was in Israel a couple of weeks ago, it, interesting to hear their take on a lot of things, including the Palestinian peace talks, because one of the things they said is, well, they know it's fruitless. When they're talking, they're not shooting. And so your point about the rebels in Syria is a very important one. Rarely do you replace a toppled regime with somebody a lot better. You just, you just replace them with somebody not as bad. And, and Al-Qaeda is, of course, supporting the rebel. Iran supports Assad. Right now, I guess, if you we were to do it, what, what we're talking about doing, you'd be choosing between Iran, who has capabilities, you know, big time capabilities, building a nuclear capabilities, having stated their goal of liberating, you know, liberating, um, liberating uh, Israel, coming after the United States next. So that makes that makes Iran a big time enemy as opposed to, say, Syria in and of itself. And what about Turkey, who is becoming a, a Islamic community? Well, here's she's asking about Turkey, who's becoming Islamic. Um, one of the interesting things happening in the Middle East is that you are you are seeing some some alliances, and Israel is sort of at the heart of all of this. Israel is a very calm, peaceful, really oasis in many respects. Because it's the one place you can go, be safe every day, and free enterprise happens all, the, all day long. Um, vibrant, progressive communities and schools, and, uh, very vibrant uh, startup business country. Um, but places like Saudi Arabia, Arab Emirates, um, maybe one or two other countries that are sort of forming more of an alliance it's more of a st stabilizing force. But let's remember, Syria is just one piece of it. You've got Egypt. Egypt, which, you know, we thought, it's kind of like the devil, you know, you know, we're doing okay with that. And then, of course, you had this takeover and it looked like it was so promising. And of course, that's the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, all of a sudden, you've got the reversal of that in terms of the military and how, what do you do about that? And of course, they also border Israel and they're big players. And the history is such that we're, we're oftentimes replacing the lesser of two or three or four evils with regimes. You know, short, short, of, short of taking over the Middle East and turning them all into America, um, we'll always have that challenge, won't we? But the Middle East, you guys, is always important for a number of reasons. There are a couple of big ones. One, of course, is our relationship with Israel and Israel's historic um, place there. But the other issue is one that we have a lot to say about here. And that is energy security. Our dependence is diminishing. And it ought, we ought to escalate and, and uh, move that dependency along much quicker than we're doing by becoming more energy secure here. I met with um, Shimon Perez about three weeks ago and then with um, Benjamin Netanyahu shortly after that. And my contribution to them was a small bottle of Bach and crew, and I said, North Dakota's contribution to your and our national security is this. And they've recently discovered, as you know, gas reserves and now oil shale reserves in Israel as well. So um, let's, let's become less dependent on the Middle East altogether, and maybe we can save some people. Yes? Okay, Gene's in the top representative. Yeah, take a drink. I think in general, Americans are frustrated by Congress's kicking up the can down the road on major issues like tax reform and the debt ceiling stuff. It seems to come to a head, and then they just kick it down the road for a little bit. 
why can't we uh, why can't we do a more permanent fix on that kind of stuff? Okay, why can't he, he said he's right. Americans are frustrated with Congress's inability to deal with the big issues in a big way, in a more permanent way, rather than just always kicking the can down the road. And I think um, some of that is we have a very divided Congress that is reflective of a very divided country. And so consequently, nobody wants to give up the, the kind of ground it takes to really move the ball in big ways. We also have a fatigue that has been built in by virtue of a $17 trillion debt to diminishing and lots of liberties and freedoms over the decades that have caused that have caused a lot of us to just hit the wall and say if we aren't careful if we don't reverse this thing fast we're we're on a slippery slope that's not recoverable so i think the pro the, the reason that the big problems aren't getting fixed the, the way we, they ought to perhaps is because the problems are so darn big they are big and they require uh, a, a working together that's not very common now that said there's that's not an excuse. Um, I, can, I can give you some sort of basic political observations after my first eight months. Um, it is far more polarizing, paralyzing even than I thought. Um, you, don't, you, you don't have a lot of people even sort of seeking middle ground. People are very dug in. Now one of the things that occurred to me, and a lot of this was during the farm, farm bill phase, there are, the, the parties, there are no more Southern Democrats. They all became Republicans. And there aren't a lot of Northeastern moderate Republicans. They all became Democrats. And so consequently, there's, you no longer have this sort of conduit, if you will, between crossing the aisles, where you have sort of big thinkers that are you know, willing to, to work together to solve problems and sort of force things. Um, along with, but that, that's just sort of a political observation. You could argue whether that's good or bad. I personally, I'm, I'm one of these, I'm somebody who loves the First Amendment um, more than any of the others because of it, because I love expression, and I don't find a really good political fight offensive. And I don't even find gridlock necessarily offensive if, if the alternative is worse. Do you know what I'm saying? I think we've somehow, in some ways, have gotten away from the sort of rigorous, we're too easily offended by rigorous debate. Discussion, so it paralyzes us instead of you know, instead of us championing it. And, and so I think those are just sort of cultural observations that I would make about it. But the kicking the can down the road thing, I would also add this. And, and I'm a cool political. I mean, I was a party chairman 20 years ago, a little better. Um, I understand the value of partisan politics. I understand the value of a two-party system and maybe a three or four-party system. Um, I think it's checks and balances our founders had figured out. You know, they, they had figured out in the checks and balances of the three branches of government, and I think the party system is working well for that. Um, but we have gotten to a point now, in my view, where it used to be where between election, between running the country and governing, you occasionally have an election. You know, every couple of years one comes out. Now, between running for office, occasionally you find some time to govern. And I mean, I've even been criticized by the other party for not raising enough money the first six months I was a congressman. You know, that, I'm like, really? This is, I was supposed to go here and raise all much money the first six months? That's weird to me. Uh, and so, I, I think, I, it's not, I'm not afraid of the partisan debate and the discussion, but I, I don't like that it's all about the election and not so much about solving problems. Those are just a few of my observations. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Kale's a dietitian. You want to talk to me right now? My name is Kale Cole. I'm a dietitian here in Minot. And you um, just mentioned the farm bill and the kind of split um, beliefs on that. What is your posi position regarding nutrition programs in the farm bill? Oh, great question. I appreciate it, Kayla. Um, just to give a little historical perspective, the farm bill has always been a, more of a food bill. I, I kind of regret that they ever called it a farm bill. I wish they would have always been called a food bill because that's a better description of it. And probably, let's see, four to five decades ago, they started passing farm bills by creating a majority coalition, you always have to have a majority, by taking pro-agriculture policy and policy supporters and pro-nutrition or food stamp, SNAP, nutrition, whatever you want to call it, program, putting them together, and then you'd build a winning coalition, a majority coalition, because you had supporters of both. 
that's not to say a bunch of people don't support both, but both represent sort of a, um, I don't want to call it a sliver, but a, a, a you know, a particular coalition, and separately, it wasn't enough to pass the bill, so they formed this coalition. And over the years, that worked very well. You have urban liberals that support, you know, the nutrition programs, and I'm being general here to make my point. And you had conservative, you know, middle Americans supporting the farm piece, and together, they're the majority. That worked for decades until this year. This year, we had a, the traditional farm bill that had both of them together. But one of the things that's happened, and farm bills are passed, or authorization bills are passed every five years, or usually six, and we're now in the sixth year. It's been the tradition to take a five-year farm bill and make it six, um, by extending it one year, because we always get the cannon down the road. Um, and, um, and in the last five years, the nutrition piece, the food stamp piece, has more than doubled. While nationwide poverty has grown 16%, food stamp participation has grown over 100%. Part of the reason for that is a down economy, more people need it, right? But another part of the reason for that is back in 1996, some of you will recall welfare reform. Bill Clinton was president, Republicans controlled Congress. They came up with a more, more of a work fair program and a welfare program that had all these work requirements for TANF and whatnot. But, but the trade-off was that Republicans agreed to make food stamps permanent spending or mandatory spending. And this is an important distinction because because it's mandatory spending, it means that if, if it's separated from the farm bill and never acted on, it continues as is. That's why I've, I've always been amused by people's objection to separating them when the people who objected to it, like every Democrat voted against it, really were sort of confused, I think, about the, about how the, the uh, outcome of that very, that very action. That said, so now, in this particular farm bill, food stamps are 80, more than 80, about 88% of the overall farm bill. We kept them together, we had a vote, and it failed. It had 172 Republicans, 24 Democrats. There were probably another 10 to 12 people that, on the sidelines that would have voted for it if it would have made the difference in passing it. I wish they would have because, you know, I don't know, board watchers create momentum, you know. But it didn't, it failed. So in an effort to resurrect the Farm Bill, and the Farm Bill had never failed in the House of Representatives, ever. That was the first time. And in an attempt to make it more palatable to more Republicans, since we control the House, there was a, a call to separate the food stamps and have a clear debate about both halves of the bill. That doesn't scare me. That, that, that level of transparency doesn't bother me. Like, I think it's important to have a clear, honest, transparent debate about both the Farm piece and the food stamp piece. So we passed the farm piece, and now next week we'll bring up the food stamp piece. Um, one of the things that, that has been objectionable to people on the food stamp side is, and, and they're gonna be very you know, frustrated next week, I think. Food stamps are about $760 billion over the next 10 years. The cuts that were proposed, and they're not cuts, remember this is authorization, so this is public policy. The policies that they opposed that would find a savings of about 20 billion over those 10 years, out of 750, 760 billion, 20 billion, were simply this. First of all, to do away with categorical qualification. So part of that 1996 compromise was is that if you qualified for any assistance program at the state level, including low-income heating assistance, you automatically qualify for food stamps, regardless of your income level. So there are some states, they do it to this day, who will give a family $1 of low-income heating assistance, even if they live in the South where they don't have heat, where they don't need you know, heating. And for that $1, they get hundreds of dollars of food stamps. Now, that's not to say that somebody shouldn't be eligible, but they should be able to, she should have to prove their eligibility. So the, the new law requires them to prove their eligibility by income. The other requirement, and the thing that really tipped it over for a lot of um, urban liberals, and I think it's very helpful, that, was um, there was an amendment that, that allowed states, we have some legislators over here, that allowed states, if they chose, to run a pilot program requiring able-bodied adults 
without dependent children, without dependent children, to either be training or being educated for a job, looking for a job, or holding a job in order to qualify for food stamps. That was so offensive and seen as so draconian, as they kept saying, that they voted against the farm bill. Now, some, many of those same people come back and say, okay, we want that bill back, we'll vote for it this time. So that is, that's been an issue. I believe what will happen next week is we will pass the separated bill. It will have a savings of probably 5% if the policies are carried out. And, and those are just estimates, by the way. This is not an appropriation bill. Those are estimates based on what if. If the policy is this, the economy does, you know, remains roughly the same. Um, so it's really applying the same qualifications as Canada requires today to the food stamp program. We'll pass that out next week. It'll go to the conference committee, because the Senate has already passed theirs, and we've passed our farm piece. And by the way, the House farm version is much better than the Senate, and every farm organization in North Dakota will tell you. And then it'll all get put back together. Because, because you only have one chamber that is separated, and they'll go together as a batch. They'll come back to the House and the Senate. The cuts won't be 5% in food stamps, it'll probably be 3%. The cuts, the cuts for farming will be about 10%. <laughs> And while farming, the farming piece has gone down in cost over the years, the other piece has gone up. So that, and then, and I believe it will be passed overwhelmingly by both chambers. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. The reason I go like this is because when I look at you all, it's, all I can see is that window. <laughs> so you're all dark, but I can see your hand. Yes. Hi, Representative. My name is Randy Schmidt. Hey, Randy, do you want to talk to the microphone? Sure. Okay. Then My I name is Randy Schmidt. I'm a cow ranch from Central North Dakota and the director for the North Dakota Stock Association. Half of them, I'd like to thank you for your work on the farm bill. And there's a couple of amendments that its membership of the Stockman's Association would like to urge you to support. Is one of them is I believe is from Representative Stephen King. It is. And the other one is uh, forgive me, making this wrong, Fletchner. Scientific based. Yes. Rulings. So those are two that we'd like to urge you to support on the farm bill. Okay. And I'd like to know how you feel. Sure. About those two. Okay, Randy, thank you, and I support both those amendments. They did both pass the House version of the bill, and they're currently in the bill's bill now. The, re the person that really will have influence over this will be, well, Senator Hope, because he's, on, he's one of the conferees on the conference committee. So the good news is it's got momentum on the House side. The, the, one, thing, the one amendment, I think it's the King Amendment you referenced, deals with um, interstate commerce, if I remember right, and the ability to, you know, to sell across state lines and, and and, that, and then the same with the, the, on the science, sound science basically was the other amendment. And those, those passed easily in the House side. I do support them. We hope, you know, we're going to urge the, the conferees to keep them in the bill. And I'm not sure, well, anyway, I'm, con I'm, I'm cautiously confident, but um, we'll stay at it. Thank you for your um, support as well. The Stockton were very helpful to me. One of the things I've learned, this is why I do, this is why I do coffee with Kramer. Okay, now, how do you get this? Um, to be successful, the, Heidi knows I have a very good sense of humor. <laughs> um, to be successful in this business, you can either be smart or resourceful, and I lean heavily on resourcefulness. So this is why the aggregate wisdom of the, you know, of the constituents is really valuable for me. But groups like Stockman's group, the Stockman's Association, the grain, the grain groups, you know, Sunflower Group, the Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, all, all of the commodity and organizations have been very, very helpful to me. We had some really good amendments I was able to get into the House bill that I hope can prevail um, because it would be very important. Daryl Lease, my egg guy, who's from here and also runs my mind offices here, so if you don't know Daryl, there he is, get to know him because if he's not in the office here, he's out visiting some farmers someplace probably. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, back to food stamp. Back to food stamp. You uh, said talking about recouping. Well, the food stamp program has to biggest sieve in the state. I work for, at a place that takes up food stamps. The abuse is horrible. So if they, would you support some type of monitoring so sure. that it, you know, we don't have to lose so much money. I realize people need, some yes. people need food stamps and that's fine. But there is, I mean, the abuse is ridiculous. Sure. Fraud, waste, and abuse is, is an issue in lots of programs. Medicare, it's right, it's important. So food stamps and then various other entitlement programs and, and social service programs and 
probably the farm program. We know that there's a waste abuse in uh, the crop insurance program, for example, as well. And anytime you have a lot of money involved in something, there's going to be some of that. Um, and yes, there are some abuse sort of checkpoints, if you will, uh, mechanisms as well in the House Farm Bill. And part of it, you know, part of it was supposed to go away when we went to the EBT cards versus you know the actual stamps and the inability to sell, make it harder for people to, to sell them. All that if you said you work someplace, you say, hey, do you work at a grocery store or something? Where, where people, you know, I've heard of lots of stories where even in North Dakota where people buy the groceries and then sell for fifty cents on the dollar, thirty cents on the dollar. But the, you know, but but laws and abuse and stuff has always been around and will always be around and. Laws should be passed to help curb it as much as possible, but it, we also, I don't think, can let it paralyze it because it, it, because it would be like putting a highway patrolman on every vehicle. You know, um, laws and rules and regulations only work under the by the consent of the people that are being regulated, right? So you just uh, you just have to we have to do our best. We can do better, and we will. Your program is very it's monitored. Those it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wick, she, she raised a great point about some of the other programs, like WIC. Um, food stamps is one of these things, and I keep going back to 1996, when we made the, when, when I say we, I wasn't there, but when they made the big compromise for welfare reform, food stamps was sort of the giveaway for consumers. It really was. It was, a, it was and we, I didn't know it at the time, I think a lot of people didn't see it happening. So while all of these safeguards and requirements and whatnot were put in the, on the traditional welfare side, the nutrition side was sort of given away as this categorical eligibility is huge. Imagine it. Imagine. And by the way, the other problem with it is that every state is different. So some states might require 130% of poverty to qualify. Another state might require 180%. What's North Dakota to know? For qualifying for food stamps? Yeah. Okay, 20, 29,000 is poverty line. In, in, I think North Dakota is for stamps, that's like 100. 65% or something like that. Every state's different, so you, you have a moving fee scale here, and then the federal taxpayer paying into it. So, a lot of the work is trying to be done is really bringing food stamps under that same umbrella, like WIC, TANF, and other programs that are probably more sophisticated. If you could be worse, in California they could use their food card at the casino. I don't know. Thank God we're not in California. Yes, please. What I was going to say is, obviously, like you said, there's abuse in several programs, but um, one statistic here that we have is at least 45% of the participants in um, food stamps are children, and then 36% are those without um, disability or elderly. 22% of the earth is 22% of that include those with children. So that's at least 67% that are with children, and there's going to be abuse always. The other thing that concerns me, besides the actual um, giving of dollars is the SNAP education piece, which is what I really care about, because that is a piece that um, is provided through every state in North Dakota, so the Family Nutrition Program through NDSU Extension, and um, they, more education for nutrition, healthy eating, reduce healthcare costs for everyone. Amen to that, and I appreciate being a nutritionist because health, we have a dilemma, don't we? We have an epidemic, frankly, in this country with children and, and uh, unhealthy lot of this education I have a question about that. It always costs more, less to prevent something than it does to cure it later, right? Yes. I don't know if I need a mic or not. Um, is, you, uh, you keep addressing this to Heidi, correct? Heidi he Camp? No, 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 no. Oh. Heidi. No, no, no. That's me. Oh, you're right. Okay, okay. Well, I wanted to say that. I like all of them. I wanted to say that uh, we appreciate you coming out and, and doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I wish all our representatives would do what you're doing. I'll give you a, uh, you know. Thank you. All right. The other, on the other thing, on the, on the welfare folks, we have a population of 680,000 in North Dakota. Alaska has a population of 700,000. We spend more in our welfare in North Dakota than the whole budget of Alaska. We spend 3.1 billion dollars on welfare. Okay. Just want to let that know. But the other thing I want to, you, you uh, talked about passing this educational um, uh, reform bill. And the whole focus was on local control. Yes. Right? Student and success. The problem I'm having with all of this is the same problem we're having with the debt ceiling. We have a president that won't won't have a budget. Okay? He's required by law to perform a budget. 
Yet the Congress doesn't put its feet to the fire and say, you're shutting the government down if you don't have a budget. Not Congress is shutting the government down. The president is. Same thing with the education. We have core curriculum now, which is a policy. And our state bought it, and no one even knows what it is. And yet, when you look into it, you'll find out it's lack of local control. It's centralizing our educational. And what good does legislation do when we've got an executive branch that won't adhere to the laws that we have? Same with, with, with uh, amnesty. It doesn't do any good if we keep letting everybody coming in. So what are you going to do? Can you do a bill to eliminate the Department of Education? That's, if you're serious about local control, that's what we should be doing. Well, what we passed in the House was a bill called the Student Success Act, and it does not eliminate the Department of Education. Um, but it is heralded by nearly every education organization nationally and all of them locally within the state. I've had great feedback from um, school board association, uh, principal, the administrators association, NDEA, um, I didn't hear a lot from, but we, I've met with them since, and everybody's pretty well in sync on this one. It does bring a lot of control locally. It takes a lot, it really replaces um, No Child Left Behind with a much more consolidated, much more localized control. The testing, the credentialing of teachers is based on outcomes, not based on you know their degrees, for example. Um, and so, I, it will not be taken up by the Senate. I, I think that's fair to say. So until there's some changes politically. But one of the things about politics, and maybe it gets back to Randy's earlier point, <clears throat> in, a, in a divided government, um, like we have, and I mean really divided, I don't mean a little bit divided, I mean really divided government, because we're a really divided country, is the, is, is the art of the duel. What's the art of the duel? So if I can't, you know, every, there are a lot of people who want to Hail Mary every time, and they keep thinking if we throw enough Hail Marys, one of these times we're going to catch one in the end zone when the, when the defense isn't looking. It doesn't really, politics and governing really doesn't work very well that way. So I'm always trying to find a way to move the ball to the first stop, you know, and little by little have the incremental types of changes that I think people can handle and, um, and maybe we can get done. And I hope we can do it before it's too much of a crisis. So you talked about education reform.